Recall that bacteria have a semi-permeable phospholipid bilayer that makes up either the uh, cytoplasmic or cell membrane and also the outer membrane in the case of gram-negatives. There are two features to these membranes. The first is the phospholipid bilayer, and the second are proteins, either peripheral or integral proteins that are actually bound or somehow anchored into this phospholipid bilayer. In the case of the phospholipid bilayer itself, I want you to recall that there are a couple of features of these. We have two fatty acid tails, a glycerol molecule, and then a phosphate group which can have modifications on it as well. And that's just shown up here as well. So we have again those two fatty acids, one and two. We have the glycerol molecule which is a three carbon car carbohydrate. The phosphate head group here, and again, sometimes this can be modified with additional uh, attachments onto that phosphate. The structure of this membrane then is such that we have those phosphate head groups interacting with uh, the aqueous solution that the bacteria would be found in, and also interacting with the uh, cytoplasm, which is an aqueous solution as well. Those phospholipid tails then point toward the middle or in between these phosphate head groups, creating that selectively permeable barrier. Now, bacteria are unlike humans in that their internal temperature is in part going to be based on the environment that they're found. And so what that means is that there's going to be changes to the phospholipid bilayer to maintain homeostasis and to maintain fluidity as temperatures fluctuate. So, for example, as temperatures increase, that's going to increase the movement of the phospholipids. And in order to reduce, then, the fluidity and to reduce the movement of molecules through that plasma membrane, bacteria will increase the amount of saturated fatty acids within that membrane. As temperatures cool, that's going to slow down movement. And that slowing of movement then means that there needs to be more space between those phospholipids in order to maintain fluidity. And so what we find, one way to create space is to increase the concentration of cis unsaturated fatty acid tails. And you may recall from our conversations before that these cis fatty acid tails create kinks and that creates spacing between the phospholipids. On the other extreme, there are some archaea that live at very high temperatures. Bacteria that we, or I'm sorry, archaea that we would classify as hyperthermophiles. And in order to maintain, again, homeostasis and a consistent membrane fluidity, what we find with some archaea is that they actually have a monolayer where we have modified fatty acids that are not only branched, but you see here, are associated with glycerol molecules at each end. And so in creating a phospholipid bilayer, this creates a phospholipid monolayer. Some molecules can move through the phospholipid bilayer simply by diffusion. And molecules that can do this are typically small, nonpolar, maybe even hydrophobic. Examples include the gases CO2 and O2. However, there are other molecules that can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer because they're maybe charged, or they are polar, or they are large and bulky. And in these cases, then, we need a set of proteins that allow for the transport of these molecules through the phospholipid bilayer. One example is aquaporin, which allows for the movement of water by passive transport in the direction where there is water pressure. In other words, the movement of water through aquaporin is going to be dependent on properties of osmosis. Water will move from areas where there is low solute concentration to high solute concentration. Facilitated transport occurs in the absence of any energy.
What we find in facilitated transport is the movement of a molecule with the concentration gradient. For example, let's say that we have a solute here, and you see that the concentration of the solute on the outside of the cell is greater than the concentration on the inside of the cell. In other words, on the outside of the cell there are one, two, three, four molecules of the solute. On the inside there is a single one. And so the movement of this molecule is going to be from greater concentration to lower concentration. In other words, its natural movement would be towards the inside of the cell. However, if this solute or molecule is large or charged, it can't get through the phospholipid bilayer. And so it has to pass through a transporter protein. In facilitated transport, what we find are that there are specific pore proteins that, that will bind to the solute through more electrostatic interactions rather than covalent or ionic bind, binding. And then the molecule will move toward the inside of the cell. We can find these transport proteins occur, uh, being used in one of two methods. Some of them just remain as open channels. Others will actually change shape as the molecule or as that solute is moving from the outside to the inside of the cell. Now in comparison to passive and facilitated transport, active transport requires energy. We also find that molecules move from areas of low concentration to high concentration. And these types of transport proteins that are involved in this type of transport will move molecules that typically are found in limiting concentrations outside of the cell. Let me give you three examples of classical active transport proteins. The first is one that you probably all are very familiar with, where energy is provided by ATP to cause the transport molecule to change shape and bring an a, a molecule into the cell. And this is known as an ABC transporter. The second type is using hydrogen ions as the energy source. And the movement of hydrogen, hydrogen ions with its chemical gradient, so from high to low concentrations, can be coupled with the movement of a molecule from low to high concentrations. And this is just an example of simple transport. We also find this type of transport too with electrons, and we'll talk about that later on when we talk about respiration and metabolism. The third type is the one found in the middle here known as group translocation. In this case what we have is a molecule that again moves from low concentration to high concentration and then that molecule is trapped inside of the cell by modifying it. A great example of this is the glucose transporter and its, and its movement of glucose from outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. In essence, this is the first step of glycolysis. Again, something we'll come back to when we talk about metabolism. But what we find here is that as glucose moves from low concentrations to high concentrations, it is modified by an enzyme known as hexokinase, in which hexokinase takes ATP and transfers one of the phosphates onto glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate, now being modified, cannot be recognized or transported by the glucose transporter, and so essentially it's locked inside of the cell.